call that phenomenon uh, Latin Africa. Okay, so it's the Latin Americanization of Africa. As you might know from the history of Argentina or Chile, uh, it's possible to have that pattern of the, lati in the latifundia, the large farm, coexisting with minifundia across all of a country's history for decades and decades. That's the story of Argentina. This is unambiguously and definitely and without a doubt a huge drag on Argentinian productivity and growth. This is something that's been studied in great depth and detail because it's so interesting and puzzling. But having a large crop farm alongside a lot of small crop farms is something that, in the case of Argentina, can happen for a very long time. And, 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 but it's, it's, it's pretty costly. Those large farms are not competitive in an economic sense. They survive because there are very strict rules against, for example, subdividing a farm and renting out bits of it. Very strict rules against low-income people, the smallholders, climbing a tenancy ladder that is gaining access to more and more land. Um, and so you can maintain a wealthier landowning class but only at the cost of considerable inefficiency by preventing the access of poor self-motivated farmers to more land. On the other hand, there are settings where those rules get uh, removed and then smallholders can climb the tenancy ladder, gain access to that land, and productivity goes up. Yeah, and I would just add to sort of nuance, you've been using, I'd say, innocuous language to describe a lot of these processes, but I mean, the plantation systems that have persisted usually persisted by force and violence, and they usually fell by force and violence. It's not like the cotton plantations in the U.S. just kind of, well, they just weren't <coughs> viable. I mean, there was a, a holocaust to, to get the southern plantation owners to figure out, oh, we can't do this anymore. Uh, in Latin America, most of the time, I, I would even venture to say a lot of palm oil, what we see in Colombia, the only reason these plantations exist to begin with and persist in time is because they have armed militias that say, we will forcibly take a more productive land use, push people off of that land, and turn it into palm oil. So I think your, your conclusions are, are right. They aren't viable in the long term. But I think it's something that we need to keep in mind as development professionals that when we do see these things, or if we are trying to promote them or thinking that they may be viable, a lot of times they're only viable because they use violence or force to, to maintain sort of anti-economic equilibrium. Yes, and just to say a little more on that as a very important point, there are cases in which the attempt to build a plantation social structure um, just does fizzle out and never really takes hold, where the investor decides not to really hire the militia and go for it. Um, but what we're seeing in Ethiopia is a dramatic instance where people may be building some scheme <laughs> of building out very large farms uh, in these lowlands that could be quite dramatic tinderboxes uh, for labor rebellion. <laughs> so the very interesting question of whether there have been instances in history where a plantation cropping system with hired workers and an investor owner has given way to family agriculture and then reverted back to a plantation with hired workers. Um, and I can't say I can think of any examples of that. It, that, would have, that would require the introduction of some technology that made it much easier to supervise workers 
and suddenly made it possible to replace a hired worker, to, to use a hired worker instead of a self-motivated family farmer. I'm just thinking of some of the crops that maybe are still in plantation. Whether there's been any, you know, just natural market experimentation with smallholders growing those because maybe people in the families worked on those plantations, but then didn't take it on. I mean, I, I'm thinking of something uh, like pine. Yeah, yeah. So instances, pineapple may be a good. I don't know enough about pineapple. In, do you think of Ghana or Costa Rica? Um, the one instance I can think of actually that is a, a case for this is the high value horticulture sector, where there are scale economies both under greenhouse production and in the very rapid packaging and off to the airport you go with uh, high value flowers or um, where. Uh, Self-motivated family farmers just cannot compete against the integrated operation. And you can offer very low income smallholders higher income levels than they can earn for themselves by working for a wage in, quote, agriculture. But it's not entirely clear that it's agriculture when you're punching into a greenhouse, punching in a time clock into a greenhouse. It's, it is horticulture, though. It is an agricultural value chain. It's a plantation, um, and it's wage work. Uh, and that would be a case where somebody might go from smallholder green beans to, uh, quote, plantation green beans um, and have it raise their standard of living. But that's only because they're filling that European niche, which has a certain ceiling to it. Once they feed all the Belgians, that employment window is going to fill that niche, and that's fine. So most of the evidence by you know, economists and ag economists is saying, yes, there's this inverse relationship between farm size and productivity. And, and most of the evidence that examines that, in recent evidence, is between like zero and 10 equivalents. And then there's also comparisons between the small farmers, small scale farms, and then the thousand hectare latifundio that you were talking about earlier in response to her question. But there's this, there's this new hybrid that's coming up uh, in the medium scale, you know, we're talking about 10 hectares, 20 hectares, maybe up to 50 hectares. These are, th these are indigenous farmers too, or indigenous people. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not kind of foreign capital, traditional Latin style uh, people that we're talking about here. And they're growing rapidly for lots of reasons. Uh, and because they're growing so rapidly, I think that our former conclusion, which you know, I also said the same thing a couple of years ago as well, that mean farm size is declining. That's not true anymore. Actually, mean farm size is rising in Africa. But the farm size for most farmers is going down, like what you're saying, because they're un under these uh, land constraint conditions. But this is masking the fact that mean farm size is actually going up because at the very top end of the distribution, you have these 50 hectare farms that are growing like gangbusters. So, so what's your view about them? And you know, are, are they a good development? Should we be promoting them? Are they a bad development? Should we be sort of, you know, trying to put them back down to size? What's your take on them? Uh, so this is a great question. You know, clearly, so the question is in, in the in the political structure of agriculture that we have today, in many African countries, there is emerging this uh, fairly large farm indigenous uh, agricultural sector coming from wealthier, typically coming from wealthier uh, people who are well connected, often urban people farming as absentee landlords, but sometimes people within rural areas who have a good connection and build up a larger land area. What's the best response to that? I think. There's two kinds of evidence about the agriculture farm size productivity relationship. One is the sort of micro econometric evidence about different farm sizes, individual ones. Another is a macroeconomic kind of evidence about whether if the, far, if the land is distributed equitably among farmers, do those societies have faster poverty reduction and economic growth than societies that have concentrated in, in highly, quote, efficient larger scale farms. So, both kinds of evidence point in the same direction. 
uh, this point that more equitable distribution of the available land um, tends to be more productive. So one might think about these larger farms um, in one of two ways. Either they're telling us something about what is that equitable farm size that much of Africa has had, has opportunities still for growth in cropped area and especially cropping frequency as a fraction of total land. So even as farm size in the way I've described it, which is total acres per rural person, um, shrinks, much of Africa's intensification may consist of reducing pasture, making pasture more efficient, increasing the integration of livestock with cropping where that happens, increasing irrigation, and expanding cropped area or frequency of cropping. So some of it, some of this large farm phenomenon is just that, that is expanding cropping at the expense of livestock and so forth. Um, but a lot of it is muscling out the poor and pushing the poor into poverty in a way that is, uh, if it's sustainable, it's not equitable, and often it's not even sustainable because of a labor rebellion or other kind of problems. So there's both things going on. That is the efficient expansion of farming by those who have capital, where you're replacing cropping, and more intensive cropping, from with gra as opposed to grazing um, or, or fallow land. And, uh, and the uh, and the displacement of smallholders, which is the non-efficient. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you.